for the ways that you've um, given us to, to be able to see that, God, that you've given us your word, uh, you've given us um, this ability to, to pray to you, uh, you've given us uh, relationships with fellow believers, God, all these places where we can see your love for us, um, all these places where we can see it. Uh, even today, we don't have to, we don't have to just think of, of biblical times, but God, that you show us that you love us now and that we can experience you um, presently. Uh, so I pray that um, as we go about this semester, as we go about our lives, that we look for ways that we can see you, God, um, and that we, we don't just, uh, you know, throw things up uh, like they're coincidence, God, but we, we understand and we recognize when you have moved and when you have worked in our lives uh, and that we give you uh, the recognition that you deserve for that. And I, I just pray that you help us to see those, those times and those instances more clearly um, so that we can worship you for them and praise you for them. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.
in the presence of my Savior. My trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be me stronger in the presence of my Savior. the music we've had this week and I want to thank our musicians. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been very uplifting and I'm very grateful uh, that we could have this uh, in-house Bible conference. It's a tradition here at Piedmont and uh, hopefully it's been beneficial to you. Today we have our third speaker, uh, Professor Wayne Willis. Let me give you a little background. You may already know some of these things since I announced him previously on other occasions. But he's a former pastor. Uh, he was also formerly the chairman of the Bible department here on the undergrad back years uh, past. He's currently now a graduate school professor, but also occasionally in the undergrad uh, professor of theology. He received his uh, Bachelor of Theology degree from here uh, back when we were called Piedmont Bible College. And he got his MDiv from Grace Theological Seminary. And he's currently uh, in the latter stages of his PhD studies and hopefully will begin his dissertation here uh, in the coming months. <laughs> so uh, having said that, he also is I forgot how many years he's been married, but his wife uh, is Alice, and they have two daughters and one son and eight grandchildren, unless that's another grandchild child from last year. <laughs> so if you would welcome Professor Willis as he comes to share with us. Thank you, Dr. Tyler. Boy, it's really good to see you. Isn't it beautiful outside? Maybe we should have it outside. I don't know. But amen. <laughs> uh, birds that are around our house are confused. We have a, we have a bird house on our uh, fence, and every year bluebirds, a family of bluebirds come there. And uh, just a few days ago, I saw one of the bluebirds looking in, like, you know, I guess it's time to build a nest again, not realizing that we're smack dab in the middle of the winter. <laughs> so I don't know if they're going to build their nest or not. But. Listen, if you get confused after this, uh, this talk, <clears throat> welcome to the world of uh, amillennial and postmillennial eschatology. <laughs> That's what uh, happens, uh, and you know, I get confused as well. There's been as many probably stated uh, 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 statements on the internet that, uh, that B.B. Warfield was postmillennialist, that is using the gospel to build a kingdom, a Christless kingdom, before he comes. Uh, as, as there are amillennialists, millennialists who believe, you know, there, are no, there is no kingdom uh, and there's a conflict between the city of God and the city of uh, Satan, as uh, Augustine taught. So there's, there's confusion out there as to exactly who, uh, who Warfield uh, is. 
Um, but uh, <clears throat> we will look, I'll look briefly at his life, and I just want to talk about him a little bit, um, you know, to, to get sort of a background. There were four uh, successive chairs of theology at Princeton, the old school Princeton, and uh, it was uh, Archibald Alexander, and then Charles Hodge, who's uh, a, a most prominent theologian of the uh, of that era uh, and later in the 19th century, and then his son A. A. Hodge, who was named after Archibald Alexander, and then B. B. Warfield, who was a, a chair of uh, of that department for um, uh, 23 years. <laughs> but let's go on. <laughs> All right. Uh, Addressing his life, the family background uh, that D.G. Hart says, and I wanted to just share this with you a little bit. To be sure, Machen was one of the most unusual fundamentalists, he says. He grew up in the affluence of the, and privilege of Baltimore's cultural establishment. His father, Arthur Webster Machen Sr., was one of the city's most respected attorneys. His mother, Mary Gretchen Machen, uh, an active reader uh, of Victorian poetry and author in her own right, thrived on the duties of polite society, counting among the guests of her home, the university presidents, Woodrow Wilson, Princeton, and uh, Daniel Coit Gilman, uh, Francis Landley Payton, uh, and authors Henry Van Dyke and uh, Sidney Lanier. So it was a, a cultural backdrop for B.B. Uh, Warfield. He, uh, I believe God strategically used uh, Benjamin Breckridge Warfield in the fundamentalist liberal battles uh, of the 19, early uh, 20th century. Um, and he was a staunch defender of the faith. Uh, he loved the Lord. He loved the Word. Um, and, and can teach us many, many things. We learn a whole lot from uh, B.B. Warfield and his stand on the scriptures and his writings. He's a brilliant man, uh, articulate uh, scholar. But I respectfully disagree with Warfield uh, on his eschatology. And I want to emphasize that word respectfully. I think we should watch our attitudes. You know, sometimes you read uh, statements about dispensations on the internet and, and, and they're vile. I mean, they're hard and we're a cult and things like that, accusations. I think we should watch our responses when we talk about these uh, great men. These, these, uh, these people love the Lord and B.B. And, uh, Warfield was not an enemy of the cross, but certainly I think he was wrong on his attitude of eschatology. I, I, have, I believe um, uh, eschatology, predictive prophecy, uh, is definitely an important subject since uh, it is stressed as such in the scripture and becomes uh, used throughout the Bible as a motivation for us to, to live uh, godly lives in, in various ways and as we wait for his imminent return. It's important that we get that right and not shrink back when we talk about, about these subjects. And so we're going to look at that eschatology, focus in today on eschatology of B.B. Warfield respectfully. I, I'm, not, I'm not attacking his character or... Uh, his strategic uh, place that God used him in history, but I, I do think he was wrong, and men of God can be wrong in, in areas like that. Um, so we'll, you know, post-millennialists, like I said, believe that the gospel is the instrument to bring in the kingdom. I saw a sign the other day on, down, down the road, a, a symposium of sorts on building the kingdom. And there's a lot of kingdom talk today, so... Uh, it's, un, it's important to understand these different perspectives. Uh, Amillennialists uh, do not believe that there will be a kingdom at all, no kingdom. And they have the same method of interpretation, basically, you know, uh, emphasizing uh, the allegorical uh, uh, method that is taking the Old Testament allegorically and the New Testament literally. And, uh, and, and I'll talk about that later. And they see, therefore, no distinction between uh, the church and Israel, which is very, very uh, important. So War, Warfield saw Revelation 20. If you want to turn to Revelation 20, just kind of keep that in, in the backdrop as we discuss it. He saw that as occurring before the physical return of Christ. And um, he held to a recapitulation view of Revelation of sorts. 
Each of the seven sections, he says, saying seven sections, repeats the events occurring between the first and second advent. That is the the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. Going over again uh, those events and uh, and with different emphases, uh, he says. Now, he has four principles, four principles of interpretation. He called it the principle of recapitulation, which I just talked about. That is... Every section opens, um, uh, uh, returns to opening of, uh, of, of this age and then recaps this age. But each section uh, doing it differently with a different emphasis. And he has something called successive visions where you see the visions follow one another and are connected to one another and are, form a complete picture. And, and symbols, a principle of symbols. Symbols... Uh, he treats like parables. That is, you don't emphasize the details of these symbols. There are pictures, and again, we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> and also, <clears throat> there's an ethical purpose, a spiritual and ethical purpose to make wise unto salvation. Now, uh, Warfield, we talk about amillennialism. Uh, Warfield was different from Augustine. Now, Augustine was an amillennialist, and it probably was used to uh, as a megaphone to introduce uh, uh, amillennialism in the stream of Christ, uh, church history more than any others. And then it filtered through the Roman Catholic Church and, it, and now it's, it's still alive through uh, covenant uh, theologians and so forth, uh, ver- various forms. But uh, Augustine view, viewed the kingdom as the church on earth. That was his view. Now, he changed, Augustine cha- even changed from an earlier view to a later view, but he came to see the church uh, as the kingdom, uh, Revelation 20, uh, is also uh, before the second coming for him. But, uh, uh, but Warfield differed from Augustine. Even though he was a amillennialist, he saw the kingdom uh, differently, not as the church on earth, but as, um, as, uh, as saints, dead saints, uh, in the immediate, intermediate state in heaven. And we'll look at that in, in, in a minute. But that was his difference. So he sees it as the state of the blessed dead um, uh, in heaven. That's, the, that's Revelation 20, 1 through 6 is what we have. He sees that not describing the church on earth like Augustine. In other words, uh, it is distinct from the living saints living on the earth who were characterized by Warfield as being under the sphere of Satan's assault. So in Warfield's uh, view, approach to Revelation, he dismisses uh, uh, a literal understanding, just like Augustine does, of the binding and loosing of Satan. Like, we would see that as actually occurring, and, but all, all our, our meals would dismiss that uh, as, uh, as, and explain it otherwise, not literal. And, and they would dismiss a literal understanding of the first resurrection, uh, verse 6 of Revelation uh, 20, and a literal and normal understanding of the word nations as well. So there are three, three primary uh, denials there. Revelation 20 for Warfield depicts not a literal war, uh, but uh, the victory of the gospel of Christ in the world. The details, he says, uh, of the vision simply mean the completeness of the victory without going into explanations of the details, which is characteristic of that approach. Um, the vision of Revelation 20 uh, uh, is the whole period again between the first and second advent of Christ, first coming and second coming. Just like R- Romans 11, he says, and 1 Corinthians 15 is in symbolical form. The thousand years, uh, six times mentioned in Revelation, Warfield says, is the sacred number plus the sacred number three. The sacred number seven plus the sacred number three, you get 10 cubed, that's a thousand. Well, that's true, and that's, so that's a, uh, the ultimate perfection uh, and a symbolic uh, a thousand year peace on the earth. The binding of Satan and the loosing of Satan, according to Warfield, are not time events, but are spheres, like I've already said. In other words, the binding is the reference to the sphere, but sphere of, if I can say it, sphere sphere of protection given to the 
uh, saints who are now in, departed saints who are now in, in heaven. So that's the binding of Satan. He can't touch them anymore because they're dead saints and it's the intermediate state and they're in heaven. And so Satan is, uh, can't get to them. And so he calls that the binding of Satan. The loosening of Satan is a reference to his assaults to the living left on the earth. And uh, the loosening represents the, uh, uh, represents the church saints on earth, the, the, the church militant. It's called the church militant on the earth. The church victorious is the church in heaven. So the nations also are said to be an inclusive term, uh, namely referring to believers and unbelievers. So what he does with Revelation 20, uh, he, 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 uh, I'm moving quite along, uh, along a little bit, but I, I'll... Uh, I'll try to emphasize the, the asterisk things I have here. Warfield was apparently influenced by the eschatological view of Frederick uh, Dusserdeck uh, in 1859 and another man by the name of Theodore Cleethoff. That's what, in fact, he, he quotes, Warfield quotes Cleethoff in the, the Millennium and the Apocalypse in his Bible Doctrines, pages 643 and 44. No one is exempt from influences, are we, of others. And they had to that, held to that view, and, and, so, did, and so, did, so did he. Okay. I'm a little late on that. Uh, I want to just offer a critique now, uh, and moving along, a critique from my perspective, from a dispensationalist perspective. I'm a dispensationalist. Not, not that I see that as a cause. I'm not a dispensationalist first. I, I, want to come, I want that to come from my biblical theology and my systematic theology and as a natural product out of the text. I don't want to force that on the text. None of us do. But I think uh, dispensationalism answers uh, uh, is, is, the, is, the cons is the product of a consistent application of a normal, and I know it's all these different descriptions, but a natural, what Schofield said, or literal uh, hermeneutic to the scripture. It's a natural product. And that's why I am a dispensation. It's more consistent. That's the word Dr. James Boy kept emphasizing at Grace Seminary, consistency. And that's what uh, dispensationalism is. First of all, the theological method. As mentioned, uh, uh, B.B. Schof uh, B. B. Schofield, uh, B.B. War. Warfield. Schofield, Warfield. Well, that's understandable, I guess. They're different. <laughs> but B.B. Warfield, uh, his theological method, uh, we would emphasize, he starts from the New Testament and goes into the Old Testament. And so he, he, he understands the Old Testament from a New Testament perspective. But he starts with the New Testament. And he interprets the Old Testament figuratively, allegorically, spiritualizing it, that's a word that used by some, even Schofield used that ter term in, in, in arguing against it, uh, spiritualizing the Old Testament and taking the New Testament literally. So there are two different approaches. And so they go, and they, they call that theological interpretation. They go back, they go back from the New Testament and they interpret the Old Testament that way. That was his methodology. That's the methodology of uh, uh, covenant theologians. It's the methodology of amillennialism. And post-millennialism, that's what they do. So there's, there's, there's no discontinuity. There's one people of God. They don't see a distinction, therefore, but between the church and Israel. There's no distinction. They blur those together. And so that, I would say that his uh, methodology uh, is, is, uh, is flawed. And then there's his hermeneutic is inadequate. August, Augustine called it multiple meanings. What do you mean hermeneutic? The way you interpret scripture, rules of, of interpreting the Bible. And that's basic. We all have those rules. And how do you interpret the Bible? Well, uh, his approach was not new. It's a long tradition among allegorists, allegorists, especially with, uh, uh, beginning with the catechetical school of Alexandria, Egypt and, and people like Origen. And then uh, in Egypt, it, it, it was made more popular uh, by Augustine 
and its influence on the Roman Catholic Church, as well as Reformed theology now. It's, it's still going on. It's a stream. It's, uh, it, was, uh, it basically allows, and I know I'm a little, I'm taking it from my, <laughs> my perspective, it allows uh, you to uh, make up meanings out of thin air. Without, without, uh, without a, bi a biblical text to b base that on. And it's different from a type. A type interprets the passage first literally and, and applies it literally. And then it sees it as an there's a correspondence uh, passage uh, in the New Testament. But uh, allegory can make it up. And August Augustine did that with the four rivers in, 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 uh, in Eden. Four virtues. What? You know, that's just making it up out of thin air. You can go in your office and just make up a, a sermon. Imagination. Let your imagination run. So it's still employed uh, with regard to predictive prophecy among all millennials. Post-millennialist, covenant, reform, for example, R.C. Sproul, uh, who is a preterist, applies two different methods to the same passage in Matthew 24 and 25. He sees the this, uh, this generation is literal, but the coming of Christ is, is, are the Romans to destroy the city of Jerusalem in AD 70. Of course, with dispensationalists, when we approach the scriptures, we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we apply a natural, normal hermeneutic. I, I like what a Genevan pastor back in the 19th century, Emil Gruis, said. And speaking thus, we do not mean to say that what is manifestly figurative is to be taken to the letter. Again, we simply say that a literal interpretation, when it does not interfere with the Bible, nor common sense, is the safest. We say that when a passage expresses figuratively or in a symbol a fact with the context, context or parallel passages expressed literally, the literal passage ought to explain the symbolical passage. And there, in Warfield, there is inconsistent exegetical conclusions. Now, we are futurists here at Piedmont with regard to the interpretation of Revelation, as opposed to a historicist uh, who sees it as a recapping of church history, or preterist who sees it all in fulfilled uh, the past in AD 70, or idealist who uh, is a liberal view who sees it as great uh, themes. Revelation was written in AD 95, we assert here, uh, under the reign of Demi uh, Diocletian, and not during the reign of Nero, AD 65, as preterist, uh, Hanegraaff, uh, uh, Sproul believed. That is, it is written after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Therefore, it can't be a prophecy of that event. The biggest bulk of Revelation we see is, the, uh, is yet future. Revelation 1 is the vision of Christ, 2 through 3, the churches, 4 through 5, the heavenly scene. Uh, of, uh, uh, and the Lamb of God takes this uh, uh, scroll and it unfolds. And, there, uh, uh, and Revelation 6 through 18, the tribulation period yet to come even in our future in 2015. The second coming in Revelation 19, followed by Revelation 20. Uh, so he comes before the kingdom. And so the outline is provided in Revelation 1.19. That's our view. And, and so we say uh, the, the linear, linear chronological sequence in Revelation argues against B.B. Warfield. The, uh, the uh, sequential chi. And, and uh, we say that the seal judgments, uh, seven seal judgments and trumpet judgments and bowl judgments are different. They're different. So the linear chronological sequence of events in Revelation is consistent, we say, with the future prophetic events, and this is important, listen to me, with the entire corpus of Scripture. It, it should be observed, for instance, the Old Testament, when the end times eschatological events are described in that context, in the context of the time frame, the worst of all times is always uh, before the best of all times, uh, the kingdom. As it's presented in the script, the Davidic literal theocratic kingdom of God to be established on the earth. Always in that sequence throughout the Old Testament. And, and the chronological uh, sequence adopted uh, or supported by our Lord's sermon in Matthew 24, 25, known as the Olivet Discourse. According to the normal natural interpretation of the apocalypse, obviously the second coming precedes the events 
of Revelation 20, 1 through 6. This is what I say then. In ordinary reading of Revelation, understanding that the language is highly symbolic in nature, reveals that the text of Revelation complements, harmoniously completes the prophetic data recorded in all the books of the Bible, especially the prophetic biblical text preceding it. The results comes without changing hermeneutical gears. It's normal. I call attention to Charles Powell who wrote uh, uh, an essay titled Progressive Ver Versus Recap Recapitulation in Revelation 20. He points out, for example, the text that Revelation 20, 1 through 3 is not a recap of Revelation 9 through 1 through 11, as they assert, or 12, 1 through 11. And he points out the difference in, you know, Revelation 12, 1 through 11, for instance, Satan is thrown down from heaven to the earth, and therefore his activity is confined to the earth. Revelation 20, 1 through 3, Satan is cast from... through 11 results in increased persecution for believers and the deception of nations. And Revelation 20, 1, uh, 11, Satan is bound for a thousand years, prevents him from deceiving the nations. That's the purpose given. Obviously, it's not a recap. And, uh, and Warfield views the, uh, like we said, the reign of the saints to be in heaven in Revelation 20, away from, the, away from the assaults of Satan. But the saints of God are consistently uh, uh, described, as Powell says, in, as reigning on the earth with Christ, like uh, Revelation 20, uh, like Revelation 2, 26 through 27, clearly related to the second coming. He who overcomes and, and he who keeps my deeds unto the end to him I will give authority over the nations, he says. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of potter, that and are, that are broken. It's certainly Revelation 5, 10, it's not a reign in heaven. Listen, definitely, it's definitely a, a places the reign of the saints on the millennial earth, not, not up there. It says, you have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God and they will reign upon earth. Upon what? Earth. And so we could go on, uh, you know, uh, Warfield argued the binding of Satan was not actual, but rather with reference to the sphere. But uh, it, obviously, when you read the text, he's locked up, he's sealed, only to be released. And when he's released again, he goes out again and deceives the nations that are, are in the four corners of the earth, it says. So when he's... Uh, he is certainly not bound today. He has a long chain, somebody said, if he is. You know. He is going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may. He's the prince and power of the air. He's the god of this age. Now, Augustine, I guess, saw that binding as somehow related to the preaching of the gospel. And in that sense, he thought he was restrained. I'm not sure. But he's not... And the spiritualization of the first resurrection is used 42 times, uh, anastasis, in the scriptures, and it's consistently used with reference to a literal resurrection of the body, a literal body, except maybe uh, Luke 2.34 might be an exception. But to totally out of whack that the first resurrection refers to a, uh, the regeneration of believers, as they say. So, and an early allusion to the millennium described in Revelation 20 is consistent, I say, with the literal yet future theocratic Davidic kingdom, earthly kingdom described in the Old Testament. Isaiah 2, 2 11, 65, Micah 4, Daniel 2. The understanding of Christ came to establish his literal kingdom is seen in the scripture. In Acts 1, 6, the apostles, after the three and a half year ministry of Christ on the earth, believed that it was still coming. Are you going to at this time restore the kingdom? Are you at this time now? Their understanding was the same. It wasn't spiritualized. And, the, and, and then the loss of perspicuity. Luther, according to Pettigrew, said, I say with, 
with res uh, 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 respect to the scripture, I will not have any part of it called obscure. In fact, the Princetonians, Charles Hodge, wrote this, the Bible is a plain book. It is intelligible by the people, and they have the right and are bound to read and interpret it for themselves so that their faith may rest on the testimony of the scriptures and not on the church. Perpiscurity, clarity of the scriptures, uh, was, uh, uh, was I, I guess, you know, a, a cardinal uh, doctrine of, uh, of Princetonians, yet they, they violated it immensely. Let me, let me read to you what, uh, what Walbert uh, rights regarding the implications of uh, Revelation symbolic emphasis. And we can go, I think, yeah, there it is. It's right there. The ascertainment of the meaning of the apocalypse is the task, that is to say, not directly, the, uh, uh, not directly of verbal criticism, but of sympathetic imagination. Sympathetic imagination. Teaching of the, and then he explains it. The teaching of the book lies not immediately in its words, but in the wide vistas, its visions, open to fancy. It is the seeing eye here, therefore, rather than the nice scales of linguistic science that is needful more obviously than in most sections of the scripture. How do we know what those visions are unless we read them with putting the words together? They're explained by words. Meaning of the scripture is in the text. I mean, the meaning is in the text. That's all we have. That's all we have. That's all I have. Other words. You know, in a paper entitled Amillennialism and Millennial Kingdom of Revelation 20, Sam Storm quotes uh, Warford on the meaning of the thousand years. Listen, the sacred number seven, I already alluded to it, in combination with the equal, equally sacred number three forms the number of holy perfection, ten and and when this ten is cubed into a thousand, the seer has said all that he could say to convey to our minds the idea of absolute completeness. Therefore, when the saints are said to live and reign with Christ a thousand years, the idea is that of inconceivable security and blessedness is beyond expression by ordinary language. We, this is really important with regard to communicating the scripture. God invented language. The purpose is to communicate it. We can get to a place in our seminaries, and I've, I've been in a seminary, in, uh, in, our, in our institutions, and where, where the, the man or the woman sitting in the pew is out of it. There's no way they could ever get it. And I believe the, the God who's, who has bent over backwards by even the stars to teach us, and the, the universe to teach us, to learn, you know, Psalm 19, to teach us, you know, about himself. Bent over backwards to communicate plainly what he wants us to know. Why is this, port why is this you know, why is this uh, important? Well, why is this study important? Because, quickly, because we are dealing with the proper interpretation of the Word of God. It, it, at once, it raises the stakes. It's not just another piece of literature. It's, it's the scriptures. It's the light. It's the lamp, lamp unto our feet. We need to get this right. Because only the biblical text is infallible, not our exegesis. My exegesis of this text is not infallible. I could write all books and books, and books, but it's not infallible. Only this is infallible. No, the only thing is infallible is this. And so how can I best protect me from the text? Protect it from me? I have my bias. I was born in North Carolina. Lived in uh, Alexandria, Virginia, and Detroit, Michigan. I have biases. I have all kinds of biases for my life, and you do too. How do I protect it this from me, that is uh, recognizing I do have biases, you know, you know, God doesn't speak with a southern accent. You all in the text doesn't mean y'all. And it's, I've got these things. I can, so how to, well, realizing I have these biases and number two, applying consistently 
in all genres of, of the text, a hermeneutic that's consistent. Consistent application. That protects this from me. And to be honest with that, recognize. And, and number three, because it, it, if we miss the import of Revelation 20, we miss the significance of, that God attaches, his, attaches to keeping his, the importance of keeping his promises to national Israel. Since four unilateral covenants, unconditional, are given to Israel related to the end times. Fulfilled at the second coming. They will be fulfilled at the second coming. This is not the inauguration of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. It begins at the second coming. Davidic covenant. He's going to sit on the throne of David then. He's not seated on the throne of David now. He's the king in waiting. He's not, he's not the king of the church And so God puts that importance of him keeping his word. This is about that. This is, a, this is about that because this kingdom is the promised future kingdom to be established on the earth, prophesied in the Old Testament. It highlights the integrity and faithfulness of our God in fulfilling his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Paul says this, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. Jacob, this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. It's about the integrity of God. Not, <laughs> it's, it's really not about the, the, you know, Israel. It's about God. He is faithful. He's to be praised. And so for me to spiritualize Revelation 20 and even jumble it up so, you know, it's... it's Somehow I have a part in this in post-millennial part of something. And, and to spiritualize it away in thin air is to, is to miss the point. He's able to do this. He comes, you know, 19 comes before 20. And it does in the book as well. The events, I know chapter chapter's not inspired, but the events are in the chronological sequence. Only Jesus will be able to pull off what is described throughout all the Old Testament text culminating in Revelation 20 of the kingdom. Only Jesus can pull that off. We can't do it in our political parties. We can't do it in our church. We can't do it in all of our efforts. Only Jesus can do what Revelation 20 describes. It's really good to speak to you. Uh, I'm excited about stuff like that, aren't you? Why? It's the Word of God. Again, B.B. Warfield, I think, was a fantastic person. God is to be praised for his contributions. But I think it was wrong here. I think it was wrong. And I believe he's, Jesus is coming. And uh, he's going to take us away. And I believe uh, there'll be a time of trouble such as not ever since there was a nation until now or ever shall be. And I think that Jesus will come approximately seven years later. Why, Wayne? Because you're dispensationalist? No, because I just take this text uh, plainly. I believe it. We believe it here, don't we? We believe here. Have a great day. Enjoy the weather. That's our prayer. Thank you, Father.